So if structures. We know how to do this. We have dual alternative and single alternative. If a dual alternative is when there's an else involved. We could throw that in there, and then it'd be a dual alternative, whatever this is supposed to print, right? Print of something or other. That's a dual alternative if. You may as well make mention of that over here. Dual alternative if means if else. Single alternative if just doesn't have an else. And then you can chain them together. If, else if, else if, else if, with a final else, something like that. So, I think the reason this slide is going back to the idea of if statements, which we already know, is the idea of using logical operators like and and or inside a statement. So we could have something that looked like this if you know x and y or if x or y. And we've already talked about it enough to say that and means both sides have to be true. And or means one side or the other or both has to be true. So if we had something like this, a is equal to 1, b is equal to 2, and so if we did if a is greater than 0 and b is less than a, is that a true or a false? Well, and means both sides have to be true. So let's look. Is that true? Is that part true? Considering if a is equal to 1, then that is true, yeah. But is b less than a? No. No, so that's, this side is false. So the whole thing's false because and requires both of them to be true. How about if a is less than b or a is equal equal to 2, something like that. Or means just one of them, except actually I goofed. It's those guys. All right. So, which, we'll just check them. Is this part true? That first one's true, so it's not going to even bother checking the second part. It's going to skip checking the second part. It's already true. But if it did, that's not true. That's a false, but it's okay, because or just means one side has to be true. <clears throat> and if we have something that's longer, if a equals equals 1 or b equals equals 2 and a equals equals or a is greater than b and this is just stupid because obviously anyways but we need to figure it out or the computer is going to figure it out and it's not just going to run left or right instead it's going to do this part part first because if it ran left or right that would be true, and that would be true, and then it would and it against that, and it would say that's false, and so it would say the whole answer was false. But it's not. Just like multiplication, we have to do and first. So let's say, let's see if this is true or false. Both of these guys have to be true. B is equal to 2. That is true. Is A greater than B? No, so that's false. So this entire side becomes false. But this is an or now, so if either one of them is true, then it's going to be good to go. So is A equal to 1? It is, so, so the whole thing is true. Whereas if we just started reading left to right and trying to figure it out, then we might have thought it was false. So the and means that this part has to be done true. Excuse me, done first. Just like we put parentheses around it. And if you feel like it, if you're looking at something like that, you're trying to figure it out by hand or something, feel free to put the parentheses around it just to help your eyeballs see it better. So if we ask them a question, and we want to let them type in uppercase or lowercase, we could use the vertical bars to do that. 
Is your response an uppercase Q? Or is your response a lowercase Q? Then print exiting program. So here they're introducing the idea of something called is digit. What is digit does is it checks to see if a character is actually a, a numeric character. Because you know there's a hundred different buttons on the keyboard, but only ten of them are digits. And sometimes it's really important for us to know if something is a digit or not, so we can turn it into something that can do math. So what we're asking is please enter a letter. We read it in with scanf to read in a character, it's percent C. Oh, that's a, a good test question. To use scanf with an integer, we use percent D. What is the code we use to read in a float? What is the code we use to read in a care? Now we just saw the care. We already know the answer just from looking at it. It's percent C and a float. What's the float? Percent F. Yeah. Yeah. So is digit, I mean we could play with it, but it checks to see whatever they typed in to see if it's a number. And if it returns a zero, it means it didn't. And I guess if it returns a 1, or at least a non-zero, then it means that it is a digit. Okay, so if digit is equal to false, that means it's a letter, and not a digit. And so it prints thank you. Else, it means you did enter a letter. That doesn't seem like the most important thing in the world right now, but we really haven't played with many functions, so why don't we go ahead and play with that one. <coughs> But we're going to do the reverse. We're going to ask them to make a menu choice, like one, two, or three. And then if they type in anything other than a number, we're going to go, meh, you didn't do it. project. Today's lecture L, I believe. Yeah, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. No, it's lecture I. Yeah, and it's decided to stick my project in the repos folder. I don't want to put it there, so let's just make a new one. Lecture I, thanks. Please put it somewhere we actually like, like my documents folder. All right. So, new item, make sure I C. It's an I, isn't it? Yeah. Grab the boilerplate. Click split. First thing I'm curious about is that is digit function. Is it part of these libraries? Does it say? Let's go take a look. Yeah, they don't say. So we'll just give it a shot. Firstly, let's just test it without even asking them any input. So care space ch equals single quote a one end quote. Now that ought to be a number. We ought to know. So if, parentheses, 
is digit in oh, parent, open parentheses ch let's see if that's enough without even putting equals zero or not equals zero or whatever two close parentheses print f percent c is a digit backslash n end quote comma and since we're not using scanf we don't need to put that ampersand in front of it we're just going to put ch else we're going to print the same message so i'm just going to copy and paste but instead of saying is a digit we're going to say is not a digit One is a digit. Good deal. I'm going to change that to like an A or a question mark or something that should not be a digit. Run it again. A is a not digit. <laughs> All right, that's bad English. It should have said A is not a digit, but okay. So that seems to be working. Are there any other functions like that other than is digit to check to see, like is alpha for a letter or something like that, or is upper? Yeah, there's is lower to see if something is lowercase. How about checking to see if it's a letter? Is alpha to see if it's a letter? All right, let's try is alpha and is lower. So I'm going to come down here, and we're going to do if is alpha, parentheses, ch, in parentheses, in parentheses, it's a letter. So printf, parentheses, quote, percent c is a letter, backslash n, end quote, comma, ch. And if that's true, then let's check it to see whether it's uppercase or lowercase. So if parentheses is upper parentheses ch close close open curly brace printf parentheses quote dot 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 and it's uppercase backslash in. probably enough. I mean, we could put some else's in and all that, but yeah, let's do else it's lowercase. So else, curly brace. Again, I love copy paste, so I'm just going to take that message and change it to say, and it's lowercase. A is a letter and it's lowercase. Let's make it like a capital X. So how do we check to see if it's a special character, like a punctuation? Now there is no if punctuation or is punctuation thing. So if we look we check there is one called is blank so we can rule out whether it's a blank or it's a letter or is a digit and if all those things happen to be the case it's not a blank letter or digit and we ought to be able to good, go well so let's find out if it's punctuation 
So we're going to use not this time. The reason we're going to use not is we want to make sure it's not an alpha and not a digit and not a space. So if not is alpha, did I spell that right? Alpha, ampersand, ampersand, and not is digit, ampersand, ampersand, not, and every time I say not, I mean exclamation point. Why is it a question mark and an exclamation point? All right, and all right, I've left something out. I'm going to have to go back and edit those. And is space. What I left out is I forgot to do the parentheses, ch in parentheses on these other two. Because it's a function. Yep, has to have that exactly. Since these are functions, we have to pass the data to them. And so let's go ahead and print out parentheses quote percent C is punctuation or a symbol. Technically speaking, everything's a symbol, right? But anyways, percent C is a symbol backslash n end quote comma ch. All right, since it's X, it certainly is not punctuation sim symbol. So let's scroll back up here and make it like a question mark or something. All right, it's not a digit, it is a symbol. Okay. So at some point we can use this technique to write like a password validator. You know how, you know, create a password it must be 20 characters long and have seven digits and three letters and 20 special symbols, whatever, all those rules that those things, you know, well, usually it's like more than eight characters with upper and lower case letters, that kind of thing. So let's go ahead and take note of these. Even though the PowerPoint is only talking about is digit, I want to go ahead and put in our notes. I guess I could just put it right here, down here at the bottom. Slash star is digit ch checks to see if the character is a numeric digit. What other kind of digits are there? I don't know. And is alpha for the ch ditto checks to see if it is a letter, checks to see if it is a letter, alphabet letter, is upper. Now I don't know what uh, is upper and is lower do if it, if you're if it's a number, right? Is a number upper or lowercase? Do they both return false? I don't know. But anyways, that's why I kind of combined it with this is alpha and then is upper because I didn't know well, we could find out but anyways so is upper and is lower check for uppercase and lowercase and then two more is space with the CCH or was it is blank I think it's a space yeah and that's just the last one checks to see if it is a space. You'd think you could just compare equal equal to a single quote space quote, but I guess we have a function to do. There may be other versions, but th those are like the four biggies. What if we wanted to write our own function calls, called is symbol or is punctuation? We could do that. We haven't written many functions yet. So let's go above main and write a function. So I'm going to come up here above main and do int is symbol parentheses k 
care ch in parentheses in semicolon and we're just going to do an if statement if parentheses not it's going to be the same thing not is alpha parentheses ch in parentheses and wait I misspelled alpha go back here and not is digit parentheses in parentheses and not is blank parentheses in parentheses two close parentheses then return a one because it's that's all true else return a zero so we could use that function just like we use is alpha and stuff like that so anytime we wanted to check it you know we could just do I'm going to delete this line but I could just do if is symbol parentheses ch rather than write that long thing here when we wanted to use it because we may need to check over and over and over if it's a symbol something like that okay so to define a function you give it a return type you give it a name between the parentheses you put any data that it accepts if any these are known as parameters this one only accepts one parameter and it has to be a character then after the close parentheses it's got a open curly brace and a closed curly brace and then there's a block of code and the return value has to match the return type so I couldn't do anything like this return Fred if it was told to declare to return an int so let's get rid of that there we go so the switch structure we're about to change gears for just a little bit don't we always but we've only got six slides left and this is just about the end of it except for random numbers random numbers are fun okay so what we're gonna do is back in the old days let's look at um, phone keypad if I can spell it phone keypad and we look at it what we see are letters and numbers back in the olden days the phone company didn't think people could remember seven digits so instead of seven three seven one two three four they'd say that it was Regent one two three four or Pennsylvania one two three four or I don't know all the names of the codes there, there were you know just about for every letter two digits they, they'd come up with some letter to try to help you remember it what other area codes does uh, Oklahoma City have like 848 so anyways if we go and Google yeah what are those um, Oklahoma Oklahoma prefix codes telephone I don't know if this is going to work yeah I want the words though I want to play like we're in the 60s probably not going to find them what if I look for region I just happen to know that was Midwest cities aha and Pershing and some others let's take a look Wikipedia has a nice great big one list so 8-4 it might have been Thornwell or Tilden or Victoria or Viking or Vinewood what was the one you said five yeah so 5-8 Juniper or Juno or Justice so anyways let's write something that takes letters and turns them into digits. Not through a mathematical process, just by if statements. Yeah, we could probably come up with some fancy math thing that would do it, but nah. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up here and we're going to ask them for a character to turn into a number. 
I went in the wrong place. I want to be right above the pause, right above the end. So let's tell them printf we will translate a telephone prefix letter to the number backslash in end quote semicolon. Now let's ask for that number, print or that character. Print F, please enter the letter. End quote, end parenthesis, semicolon. Now we need a scan F to read into our letter. I'm just going to assume that we've already declared care CH. So I'm going to comment that out. We've already got it. So scan F, parentheses, quote, percent C, end quote, in parentheses, comma. And since we're reading in rather than writing out, we do need that ampersand, ampersand CH. Now we can use some if statements. If, parentheses, ch equals equals single quote a in single quote or ch equals equals single quote lowercase a We're, this is going to be a pretty big if statement and the reason why is if we go back to our phone keypad and A, B, or C all translate to 2 and we need to be able to do uppercase and lowercase versions. So there's going to be like six things tied together with ORs. Sounds like a boat. All right. OR CH equals equals uppercase B OR CH equals equals lowercase B with single quotes around it, apostrophes. I'm going to go to the next line. You don't have to. Or CH equals equals uppercase C. And there's a way to convert an uppercase letter to a lowercase letter. I could look that up. I'm going primitive though. Or CH equals equals lowercase C. If any of that is true, then it's a 2. Why not a 1? Why didn't they start? ABC with one. Well, because one was for dialing long distance, so they didn't assign it any letters. Print F, parentheses quote one backslash n end quote, or maybe just put dial one, dial space one. And we can keep doing that. We can check for D, E, and F, and so on. So if, you know, I'm just going to copy this because that's a lot of typing right there. So else, if, oh, and you know what else is a one? A one. So let's tack that on as a final or. Or CH equals equals. Apostrophe one end apostrophe. Okay, so I'm going to copy that whole thing but change it to an else if and then make some changes because it's D, E, and F. So uppercase D, lowercase D, uppercase E, lowercase E, <clears throat> uppercase F, lowercase F, and those are all twos. So I'm going to change those ones to a two. The only weird one is the one with Q in it because it's four letters rather than three. So by the time we finally get to doing the seven, we're going to have to have a couple more ORs, two more ORs because it's got four letters rather than three. But let's test it out. Let's enter an A or a B or a C or a D or an E or an F and make sure it works. All right. We know an A is supposed to be a 2. All right. I was an idiot. I said it was supposed to be a 2, and then I printed out that it was a 1. 
you're probably thinking I'm crazy. Let's change those to twos because we go and look on the keypad. A, B, and C are two, and D, E, and F are threes. I don't know where my brain was. I took too much Ambien last night. Let's run this again. All right. So an A should be a two. An uppercase F. Just like a lowercase f, that's a 3. Okay, seems to be working. What happens if we give it something it's not expecting? Well, let's just type in a number. A 2 is a 2. Good. How about a 4? It doesn't know. We haven't implemented 4 yet. All right. Let's just do one more of these. So we're going to fill in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I as a 4. So G, lowercase g, upper h, lowercase h, upper i, lower i, or if they type in a 4 itself, then we're going to tell them to dial a 4. And then we're going to finally put in one last else we're going to assume that we've done all the rest of them. So I'm going to add a comment, else if, else if, etc., etc. And then one final else to handle it. If they type in something we don't recognize, like a question mark or some Korean character, we're going to print F, parentheses, quote, percent C is not a recognized letter or digit. Or if percent C is not valid, backslash in, end quote, comma, and since we need to fill in the placeholder, we need to actually put the variable that goes in there. Now, since we haven't implemented Z or L or anything, something like a Z, oh, did I say valid? I meant to say invalid. Or not valid. I like that better. It's not valid. Okay, yeah. So a Q is not valid. Now it is, but we just haven't added the rest. So I'm going to take this code and just kind of tuck it away in the notepad file for now. Because who knows, we might make a homework assignment or something evil out of that. I seem to have some boilerplate ready to go. Code for turning a telephone prefix letter to a number. Partial code. Alright, but there's another way of handling it, which is what this slide is going to show us. And we didn't have this in Python, so this should be new unless you've taken Java or something. What it does is it looks at the character and then it sends it to the right case. If it was a 1, you have selected sports. If they typed in a 2, you selected geography. But they made a boo-boo here. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Case 3, you selected music. Case 4, you selected world events. 5, invalid category. Okay, there's a problem. They left a break out. What I mean is there's a break after every one of these. Except that one. If there's a missing break, like if their response was 2 and it jumped here and it printed out you selected geography without the break here, without that being there, if that's missing, it does what's known as fall through. And it falls into the third case as well. And so if they typed in a two, it would print you selected geography, and then it also print you selected music. And our Jeopardy players would get confused or whatever. So that's what happens if you leave out break. Almost never do you want to leave out the break statement. You could do something specialized, and we'll show an example of that after a while. But usually we don't want to. So we could rewrite that code, all those if statements, because that's all this is, is a big if statement. If 
it's a one, print sports. Else if it's a two, print geography. Else if it's a three, print music. Let's do that with our digit specifier. I guess we could ask our question again. The more questions we ask, the more annoying it gets, but why not? I'm going to go ahead and grab the printf and the scanf from above the first if statement. If ch is equal to a and copy it, just so that our code looks pretty complete down here. I'm going to paste that below our else. But I'm going to add something to the print. This time, we will use switch backslash case. Just try it. Otherwise, we wonder why in the heck we entered the same letter twice. All right, so now we are going to do switch parentheses ch in parentheses. Open curly brace. So we said that a, b, and c print out a 2. So case, apostrophe, uppercase A, colon, wait, no colon, close apostrophe, colon. But we can list more than one case on a line. Case, lowercase a, end quote, end apostrophe, colon. And let's do B and C. Case, uppercase B, colon, case, apostrophe, lowercase b, and apostrophe, colon, case, uppercase c, and apostrophe, colon, case, lowercase c, apostrophe, colon, and then lastly, the number itself, if they type in a 2, case 2, colon. No, wait, it's got to have quotes around it because it's a letter. So case, apostrophe, 2, and apostrophe, colon. And if any of that's true, we're going to print out the number 2. So print a parentheses quote, dial a2, backslash n, end quote, in parentheses. Now let's do d, e, and f, since we did it for uh, the if statements. I've already forgotten something. I told you not to forget a break, and then I forgot the break. So let's get that taken care of. After the print f should be a break, semicolon. Now I'm going to copy that stuff and paste it and just change it to D, E, and F, making a 3. D, E, F, lowercase d, lowercase e, lowercase f, and it's a 3. Notice it gave me a little bit of a, of a clue here that I'd done something wrong. It's saying, you can't do a 2, you've already handled a 2. That's kind of nice, because when I was doing these if statements up here, if I made a mistake and like accidentally checked for an A when I'd already checked for an A up here, it's not going to tell me that I did it wrong. But this is, so that's kind of cool. And then if it's a D, E, or a F, or a 3, I'm going to tell them to dial a 3. All right, please enter the letter whatever, D. This time we'll use switch case, please enter the letter. Oh, well, what do you know, it didn't let me type in a letter. Is that wonderful news? Not really. I'm going to run it again and see if it still, if it does that two times in a row. Mm-hmm. Did I forget my scan app? Nope. Okay, I'll be right over there. Mine's behaving pretty poorly. Drats on that. I don't know what the deal is, but let me pause and come over there. We may just change it so that we don't scan app because we already have a letter to play with. So that scan app's not working. I'm not going to take the time to figure out why. Because it always worked for us before when we were entering numbers for percent up. Anyways, in fact, we don't need any of this then. Try 
static once more. So, please enter the letter A. Dial two, dial a two. It both it worked both ways. Please enter the letter three. Well, we're being stubborn. We're giving it numbers of letters, but still, dial three, dial a three. Maybe we could block out this part, this first part with the SL, if else ifs. Nah, let's leave it alone. It's all right for it to print it twice. And we need to put kind of just like we have a final else, we need a default colon. And same thing we did up here, we're going to print not valid. Print parentheses or print out parentheses. Quote percent C not valid or is unimplemented. Backslash in end quote comma ch because that's the case it might be valid but it's just not implemented so it's up to you what you think is cooler what you like better you like the if statements looking like that or you like the switches this is considered a little bit more structured but there's nothing you can't do with if statements or there's nothing you can do with if statements that can't be done with the switch and there are a few specialty things that you can do with switches that you can't do with cases but it's totally up to you like if you could write a menu program and enter one for this and enter two for that and enter three for the other then uh, you could use either switches or you could use cases switch uh, switches or if if else is you have an opinion which one looks better to you Yeah. But if <laughs> right, but if kind of clicks with what you already know, so so that that's going to seem you know the way to go unless somebody tells you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Put this into our notes. Or you could do it with switch case. So random numbers are kind of fun. Haven't we already talked about random numbers? Maybe not. Okay. Random numbers are like rolling dice. You know, If you're writing a game, you might want things to be random. right? Um, if, if the monster is in the same place every single time, that might be boring. Or, you know, if every time you play the dice game, the dice always come out in the same order, that might be boring. So there's a function called rand which I believe is in the stdlive.h library, which looks like we've got. So we're just going to make a few random numbers for fun. I'm going to come down here before the system pause. I'm going to do printf parentheses quote now for random numbers end quote end parentheses semicolon. The rand function returns an int. So let's get three integers. Int r1, comma r2, comma r3, just to hold our numbers. <clears throat> r1 equals rand, parentheses in parentheses. R2 equals rand, parentheses in parentheses. 
R3 equals rand, parentheses, in parentheses. And let's print out our random numbers. Print F parentheses, quote, random numbers are percent D, percent D, percent D, because they're integers, not floats. So we're using percent D. Backslash in, <clears throat> in quote, comma, R1, comma, R2, comma, R3. <clears throat> All right, and here's our random numbers. 41, 18,000, and something, and 6,000. Neat. Let's run it again. 41, 18,000, 6,000. Well, that's the same, those are the same numbers. It's giving us the same sequence of numbers every time. And that's not cool. We want them to be different. What a random number algorithm is, is it's really what's known as a pseudo-random number. Pseudo-random meaning that it's calculated by an algorithm. And what the algorithm does is it takes the number that it calculated last time, runs it through a math formula that you're not supposed to be able to predict, and it gets another number. And then that number is run through a math formula that you're not supposed to be able to predict to get the third one. But if the first number is always the same, all the rest of the row is going to be, you know, the same every time you run it as well. But there's a function which can so-called seed the random number generator. So that you can say, don't start with a 41. I want you to start with a different series. Calculate it, you know, as if the first number was a 7,000. And then you say, calculate it as so the first number was a 32. And each time they would be different. So let's use that seed function, which is srand for seed random. So why don't we just do srand parentheses? I'm going to just totally make up a number 27. And now the numbers are going to be different than the last time we ran it. They're still going to be the same every time we run it without changing that. 126, 3014. If I run it again, it's still going to say 126, 3014. Right. So we need a random seed. Well, how can you get a random seed if the random number generators make the same thing all the same time? What people do is they use the number of seconds since midnight or something like that, something time based, because it's very rare that you'll play that game at the same number of seconds after midnight every day. So you're not going to see the same numbers come up. And so we use a time function to fill in the srand function. So srand parentheses time parentheses in parentheses semicolon. Now it's going to look different each time we run it unless it, we happen to run it twice during the same second. Please enter the letter. All right. Well, I didn't get to see it. Ooh, it blew up. Well, well, well. Does the PowerPoint tell us about using SRAND? No, of course not. Well, that's boring. We don't want the same numbers every time. SRAND and time in C programming. Okay. Uh, they pass in something in the time function. So let's put a zero there and see if that fixes it. Stop the debugger by clicking the red stop symbol. Try again. Did 
this is getting real tedious. I'm going to type that in. Okay. So I got 19,000 and something this time. If I run it again, unless I ran it twice in the same second, 19,000. Okay. 19,222. Let's try again. 19,255. Well, at least it's changing. And then the second number is 26325. Let's find out. Okay, that's different. Alrighty, now these numbers are too big. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, if we're playing Yahtzee and we're using cubes, six sided dice, we want a number between one and six, not between zero and 65,000 or whatever it's coming up with there. We can use modulus to lower it down to being be between zero and five and then add one to it to make one and six. So we're just going to modify our random calls here. Modulus it by six because that gets it down to zero or five because no num every number divided by six will give you one of those remainders. Zero up through five. And then plus one to get it to be one through six. And let's add a comment to that effect. Random number between one and six. So if you play a game like with with strange dice like D and Dungeons and Dragons and you're using 20-sided dice, you just change the 6 to a 20. I'm going to copy that and paste it onto each one of these so that I'm generating three random numbers between 1 and 6. So I got a 1 and a 2 and a 2. If I run it again, I got a 2 and a 1 and a 3. I'm certainly not a high roller today. Please enter a righty. A 1 and a 2 and a 4. Well, whatever. It doesn't seem. I want to see some 5s and 6s. Okay, well, at least I got a 5. Seems like the first digit's always a 1. Am I correct about that? No, nope, no, nope. okay. Good deal. And it's not based on what we're typing. That typing is just for the telephone digit. It had nothing to do with this. So we could make this loop. We could make it loop and ask them if they want to repeat it and ask them if they want to repeat it again and again and again. That might be more fun. But let's not. Why don't we go towards doing our review now? So our review, excuse me, our assignment is going to be to take our telephone prefix program. Take the telephone prefix code we wrote in class, either using if, else, if or switch case, your choice, and complete it. Now that one's not going to be too hard to do because all we have to do is, is do the rest of the letters right. Right, right. So th that one's not going to be super challenging. And so we're going to tack on something. Write a program that generates five random numbers and adds them up and prints the total. The random numbers should be between 1 and 100. So instead of modulus 6, you're just going to do modulus 100. So that one's also easy since we've already got code that does three random numbers, five. We don't have to make a loop or anything, right? If it was going to be write a program that generates 5,000 random numbers, yeah, we'd write a loop to do it. But we don't need to. Not for this. So that's part B. And you can just stick in the same one. So instead of write a program, write code that part B can just be part of the same program as part A. That makes sense? 
both those. Okay. All right. I hope I haven't saved this and erased my boilerplate. It's possible I did. Yes, I did. Oh well. I'll go back. I believe this is homework five. Okay. Ah, you're right. Okay. But wait. I never made a Dropbox for homework five? That's right, and you texted me about it, and I goofed it. Okay, so what's homework five about? I'll go update this later, but I certainly need to publish it. Yeah, so that's the if and the else and the and and the or homework. All right. And we have to give ourselves time to do it. So Tuesday at midnight of the following week. Whoops. <clears throat> so, the exam. Let's take some notes. <clears throat> I already have some notes over here that I'd started. printf and scan it. What do we use? To read hints, floats, and cares. Example. Int is percent D. For printf and scan it, that's really not How about doubles? Do you remember what we used to scan if a double is to opposed to a, a float? Yeah, it's percent LD. So if we use percent, oh no, it's not. It's percent LF. LF will do it a, a double. But I'm going to delete that. But you know that now. All right, so let's go and look at the rest of the exams. All right. What are the possible values for a bit? And I'm going to upload this. If, but I mean, you may as well write things down that that catch your attention. What are the possible values for a bit? What's the answer? Zero or one? Yep, 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 yep. How many bits are in a byte? Eight. Yep. Yep. If you have a truth table that looks like this, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and the answers, the results, are 0, 1, 1, and 1. Or if you just replace that with T's and F's, or if you wrote the zeros as F 
and the ones as t. Is that an and or an or operation? Yep, that's exactly it. Yep, yep, yep. So if it was the other, it would look like this. And lastly, we know that if it starts as a 1, a 0, and it results in a 1, if it starts at a 1, it results in a 0, that's a not. So if we're going to do a comment, to do a single line, what have we been using? Every one of our comments just started with a certain symbol or a pair of symbols. In Python, it was hash. In this one, it is these guys. Yep, 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 yep. Multi line comments are instead that, right? How about modulus? What's the symbol for modulus? Yep. And sorry if people at home, you can't hear what the students are giving. No, it's, it's fine. I like it that way. They have to look it up. The symbol for modulus is... And what symbol have we used to declare our preprocessor directives? Like, like include. We always put a... Yep, hash. Yep, exactly. Now we're getting technical. To pass a variable into scanf to let the user fill it in, we use what special symbol? So all of our variables that we pass into scanf have had a something in front of them. So we can look at our scanf statement right in our code and spot that one. Yep, 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 wherever that was. Where's my scan app? There it is. Right. It's that one. Yeah. How you doing? Know the equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to. greater than or equal to symbols. What is the assignment operator? If we're going to stick the value of 3 into x, how would we write that? How would we write storing 3 into x? Just x, yep, 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 yep. So that's the answer to what is the assignment operator. Or write a line of code, not clod, code that declares an integer named x and sets the value to 100.
write a line of code that says if x is equal to or if x equals 100 print yes it doesn't just have to be one line you could do it in one line but write code that says if x equals 100 print yes we haven't talked about pointers much so I'm skipping that one what is the and symbol as opposed to the or symbol Yep, yep. So double ampersand and the double other one. And how about not, like we stuck in front of is digit? Yep, yep. Show why 1011 equals 11 in decimal. All right, so that's an 8, that's a 4, that's a 2, and a 1. So that's an 8 plus no 4s plus a 2 plus a 1. So that's why it equals 11. That's enough. That's why. Of course, it'll be a different question. I might put it 1101 or something like that. But yeah. So there are like three ways of writing add one to x. like x plus plus, x equals x plus one, and can you think of a third one? Probably used it maybe in Python. Yeah, x plus equals one. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead and scribble that down if you want. I'm going to delete those answers. So this is also known as incrementing x. Write code that adds 1 to x in three different ways. We're going to skip a bitwise and and bitwise or. I'm not going to even put it in the sample quiz, but just know how to write an if. I think we already did one up there. Know how to write an or. Know how to write an if. That means if x is between the values of 1 and 100. So that means that looks like something like this. And if it's checking between a range, we either use and or or. Which one is used to check between a range? X is less than or equal to one. And wait, wait, wait. I'm good for that one totally. I fail myself. All right. X is greater than or equal to one. And X is less than or equal to 100. That would check to see if it's between the values of one and 100. What if it was outside the range? We'd use or. Right, so if x is outside the range of 1 to 100. So instead, it's if x is less than 1 or x is greater than 100. So x is 4 within a range. 
not count what is x, and is for within a range, or is for outside the range. All right, if we have an int and a u int and a double and a float, one of these is known as an unsigned int. That's pretty easy. It's the u. Right, it's got the u in it. Unsigned means that it can only hold a positive value. So that means that the other one has something special about it so it can hold negative values, which is what? It uses a sign bit. Which of these uses a sign bit at the beginning of the number to indicate whether it is positive or negative? So, or which of these is an integer type that uses a sign bit? So that narrows it down to either int or uint, and then using a sign bit. Well, a uint would not need because it doesn't need to know whether it's positive or negative. So, which holds a larger value, a float or a double, which holds a, or which can hold, right? Which can hold a larger value, a floating point or an int. And I think I'm just going to make this a note here because we only talked about the ternary operator one day. So, using the ternary operator, write code that will store a 1 into x if y equals 100. Otherwise, store a 2 into x. So that would look like this. We're going to store 1 into x if y equals 100. So that's our if statement. The ternary operator is the question mark. So it would look like this. x equals, and then we put our condition, and we can put the condition inside parentheses, but we don't have to. So y equals equals 100. Question mark. And if that's true, we're going to store 1 into x. And if it's not true, we're going to store 2 into x. So I'm just going to leave that there. I'm not going to erase that and make y'all type it, but then the question on the exam, if there is one, will be something different. The same idea, right? If A is equal to 1, 2, 3, then store a 10 into B, something like that. Same idea. All right, we've talked about this a few times, but if I ask you for the ASCII value of a letter, you can just go to ASCIItable.com. So if I say, what is the ASCII value for a uppercase Z, you just go to ASCII table, find the uppercase Z, which happens to be a 90. Or if you typed in FA or 5A or 132, but I like the first column, the decimal. So we're going to make that our, a sample question here. That's the answer to that one. Okay. What is the decimal ASCII value of the capital letter Z? I'll ask a different letter, but if you know how to look that one up, you know how to look them all. I think we already know how to use printf statements, but write a printf statement that 
prints f equals followed by the number if f is a floating point value. And we're going to have to get out of here soon. So the only thing we didn't get to that I wanted to have done by the time of the exam are loops. So I'm going to remove the question about the loops. All right, that's about it. That's about enough, I think. I'll upload that so you can just do a practice exam and you can email it to me and text me and tell me to go look at it and I can tell you which ones you got wrong if you need to. So I would do that like by Saturday so that you could have an answer by Sunday to do you know, one last day or one last evening of study. Did you make a Dropbox for today's notes? I did not. Yes, we need a Dropbox. So this will be Dropbox I.